Welcome to today's Lunch and Learn session on team management, specifically how to recruit, build, and retain a powerful team. This is a fast-paced 30-minute session, so let's jump in and get started. I'm going to reference a couple of textbooks in this presentation to help you, but all the ideas and concepts I talk about here are tried and tested, both in running a business myself, where we achieved UK's top best employers to work for for three years running, and consistently achieved employee engagement levels and the upper quartile levels for UK and European businesses, as well as with many, many clients of my coaching practice. So first of all, why is building a powerful team important? Well, let's start with Zig Ziglar. You don't build a business, you build people, then people build the business. If you want to grow your company, you first have to grow your team. Scaling a company is all about team building and scaling a team so that they can scale the company. What's the real cost? What happens if you don't grow your team? Well, companies with disengaged employees experience 18% lower productivity and 60% more workplace errors than those with engaged workforce. That's from Harvard Business Review. Unengaged employees points to almost 7 trillion in lost productivity the world over. Unfortunately, the bad news doesn't stop there. The true cost of replacing employees can be twice their base salaries depending on their wage, role and experience. Let's make it a bit more topical to the world we find ourselves in right now, the great resignation. You may have heard of this term that's come about this year. Around the world, workers are quitting their jobs in record numbers. In the UK, job vacancies soared to an all-time high in July this year with over 1 million job posts for the first time. In the US, 4 million people quit their jobs uh, in April, a 20-year high, followed by record 10 million jobs becoming available by the end of June. As more of the economy reopens following COVID, demand for talent is fast outstripping supply. It's now an employee's market. It's not just hospitality, logistics and entertainment experiencing labour shortages, intense growth uh, post lockdown in some industry coupled with flexibility of remote work means white collar workers have more choice than where they ply their trade than ever before. And retention is the new fight for bosses. And it's one of that's being waged digit, digitally. You have to support your staff and make them feel valued. If you don't, you're not just competing with every company in commuting distance to retain the, that employee. You have to compete with potentially every company in the world. Office, office perks now have to translate to the digital world and a remote workforce. It's much more complex than wheeling in a table tennis table, tennis table like in the pre-pandemic days. And although salaries could rise in line with supply and demand, they can only go so far. Above a certain point, people want to feel part of something bigger, a company with a great culture of connection, recognition, and communication. So if a business owner or CEO isn't deliberately creating that culture, they're bound to fail. And it would be wrong to think that this issue is the result of the pandemic. Gallup's global workplace surveys pre-pandemic were warning us of this looming issue, with 85% of employees worldwide not engaged or actively disengaged with their job. And it's worse, actually worse here in the UK. You can see in this bottom right table on the slide, 89% not engaged or actively disengaged. So I want to offer you a three-part solution. Firstly, hiring the right people uh, using a four-step recruiting system. Secondly, driving performance through a results-focused team building system. And thirdly, retaining talent by creating the culture you want. So let's first talk about hiring the right people. In his classic book, Good to Great, Jim Collins referred to the importance of getting the right people on the bus and getting them all in the right seats. And this is key because who we attract and hire to our business takes precedence over what they do. You simply can't achieve consistent results until you get the right people in place. The first thing that I want you to understand is that as the employer, you need to position yourself as buyers, not the sellers. One of the analogies I use for this with my clients is fishing. Hiring is like fishing. The companies that get the best people are the ones that get a lot of fish on the deck so they can be choosy. So the idea is you want to get out there and get as many fish on the deck as you can so that you can be choosy. Now, the challenge that a lot of business owners have when it comes to hiring is they approach it like they're actually the desperate ones. They just absolutely need this position filled. They need the employee and they come to the whole thing kind of groveling. But you have to position the whole thing so that you are the buyer, not the seller. We want to have a whole lot of people coming to us, trying to get this opportunity, trying to get this job. Now, in order to be able to be choosy and to have people selling to us so that we have the freedom to make a good decision, well, we have to do an effective job of marketing the position. 
So the goal of our hiring plan is to generate more than enough leads of high quality employees by deploying multiple recruitment strategies to market for employees in unusual ways. These days we have to look at recruiting like marketing. Your ability to recruit high quality talent is absolutely, absolutely one of the competitive factors that will make your business either okay or fantastic. So here's the four-step recruitment system that we use to get the best fish, so to speak, out of the water. The first one is to prepare the bait. Our goal is to market for employees in unusual ways. And marketing starts with preparing the bait. We have to create the ad, the description of the opportunity in a way that it really gets a fish wanting to jump on board. You have to make the job appealing and not be boring. For example, there are about 20 to about 200 vacant jobs for physiotherapists in our region. If you needed to hire a physio and you posted an ad like everyone else does, physiotherapists wanted, you're competing with those 200 other job postings just like it. One client of mine wanted to hire a virtual assistant, so he wrote a personal letter to his future virtual assistant as an ad, and he got over 400 applicants. Boring doesn't work for marketing, and it doesn't work for hiring either. You need a USP, not just for your marketing, but for your recruiting as well. The second step is to cast the net. We have to get the net into the water. We have to use a, a lot of different strategies to do this and generate leads. And one of the biggest mistakes I've seen business owners make over the years is not having enough strategies out there to get enough people applying for the position. When this happens, you have a business owner deploying maybe one or two strategies. Then every time they have a position to fill, they get only two or three applicants. But the challenge is that if you've if you only got have two or three applicants for a position, that might not be enough. The big fish you're looking for, that ideal employee, might not have been one of those two or three applicants. So you have to be aggressively, proactively recruiting using a lot of strategies. We have to generate a lot of leads. We have to cast a big net. And the third step is to be able to sort the fish. Well, one of the other reasons that business owners often do not cast the big net is because they don't want to interview 10 or 15 people. They realize I want somebody great and I know I'll have to interview people. So I'm just going to get two or three applicants and kind of choose one because I don't want to burn a lot of time. But that's a very deceiving downward spiral because what's going to happen if is the business owner will get two or three people, they'll interview them, choose the best one out of the two or three. In a lot of cases, this amounts to basically choosing the lesser of two or three evils. Then they'll bring the person in, that person won't work out, then they'll be back to the drawing board. So but they didn't get more than two or three applicants because they were too busy to interview and they didn't want to spend the time sorting the fish. So that's why we have, as a third step in our recruiting system, a pre-recorded virtual interview process, which cuts down the interviewing dramatically. And then step number four is really them. You choose, you're going to choose one or two of the best ones in that group. You sort it out in that virtual process and then reel them in step four. And we do that through a test drive process, which is kind of a special interviewing process. And then the last thing you want to do as part of reeling them in is take your favorite top performing two or three candidates that have come through the test drive and put them through a psychometric profiling process. The one step can alone can dramatically reduce the chances of making a mishire. And the goal is to make sure that person you are about to hire for that position will be the right, it'll be the right role for them and role best suited to their strengths. So the four-step recruitment system is spelled out in detail in this document here, and it basically takes all the steps, break them down into detail for you. And that four-step recruiting system works, and it will change your life as a business owner. So if you'd like a PDF copy, just email me, and I'll send it to you. Now let's look at part two of the solution, driving performance through a results-focused team-building system. Author and speaker Tom Peters explained the problem this way. So most employees are motivated, energetic, committed, enthusiastic, loyal, except for the eight hours they work for you. So we need to focus on building a team that really works hard and really produces. And here's how we do that. So I've referred to the importance of getting the right people on the bus and then getting them in the right seats. But we like to take this metaphor a bit further. Not only do you want to get the right people on the bus, you want to get the right people in the right seats exhibiting the right behavior. In other words, you want to recruit the best, most talented people in the market. Make sure they're playing the right role on your team and make sure they're playing nicely with each other. And to do that, we use two different profiles. The first profile deals with getting team members on the right seat of the bus, the right role. That's the team dimensions profiling process I just referred to in the final stage of the recruitment process. And we also use that for team building with existing team members. And the second profile deals with getting them to play nicely, the right behavior. And to get this right behavior, we use a profile called the five behaviors of a cohesive team. 
The Five Behaviours is based on a book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. It's a fable about a team and its its dysfunctions. And if you haven't read this book yet, I'd highly encourage you to do so. But his Five Dysfunctions model says that most teams are dysfunctional because of these five things. It begins with an absence of trust. Teams with an absence of trust will gossip about each other and refuse to give each other credit. They'll fail to collaborate and refuse to put in extra work. And then most importantly, teams that don't trust each other will have a fear of conflict around important ideas or issues. Instead of healthy conflict, a distrusting team will instead agree with some reluctance to each other for fear of various kinds of repercussions. So they'll fear conflict. And as a result of not having good, healthy debate, good, healthy conflict, the team will experience a lack of commitment to the direction that the leader is proposing. And when the leader t- lacks, when the team lacks commitment to the direction, that team will then avoid accountability. And when team members are living in their own isolated little silos of responsibility in any business, avoiding accountability because they don't have commitment to the mission or the purpose or the direction, that always leads to inattention to results and substandard business performance. And that's why Patrick Lencioni in his book says, it's not finance, it's not strategy, it's not technology, it's teamwork that remains the ultimate competitive advantage because it's just so powerful and so rare. And the process of team building starts with an assessment of the team. It takes 20 minutes for team members each to respond to a series of questions. Once everyone in the team takes their individual assessments, they'll get back their individual and team results. It contains insights and actionable tips for working on and with your team. You also uh, see a color-coded pyramid that looks a a bit like the one pictured here, that's your team's results snapshot. And you don't have to worry, a lot of teams are in the red, it's okay. But once the assessment is complete, we can find out where we are, where we can begin to work on the activities that will build this team into a, a powerhouse of business performance. So just let's d- dive a little bit deeper into this five behaviors model. Trust is the first and foundational behavior of cohesive teams. So trust is when team members are genuinely transparent and honest with each other. And it requires them being vulnerable with one another, being honest enough to admit your mistakes and weaknesses. It, it's it's being able to say things like, hey, I need help, or I'm struggling with this, or I'm sorry. And one of the ways we can build trust is to get to know each other better. And often we spend eight or nine hours a day with the people on the, on our teams, but yet struggle to find a genuine connection or understanding of our co-workers. So within this approach, we use specific exercises to build this foundational trust. Next is conflict. When team members are able to trust each other, they are able to engage in healthy conflict or robust debate without the fear of interpersonal issues getting in the way and damaging relationships. There's an unfiltered, constructive debate of ideas, and it's your job as the leader to search for healthy conflict in your team. Next is commitment. When team members are able to offer opinions and debate ideas, they'll be more likely to commit to decisions. And it's not unusual for teams to have really unproductive discussions about an idea or a project, and everyone leaves the meeting with without a clue what the next steps are. Basically, you can disagree all you want, but the goal is to have enough healthy conflict that at the end of the meeting, all parties, whether they totally agree or not, buy into the idea or decision and commit to it. And this commitment allows teams to move into this behavior called accountability, the fourth tier. When everyone is committed to a clear plan of action, they will be more willing to hold one another accountable. And most often this happens through giving feedback. Now, feedback is a gift, but it's often the gift wrapping or the words used that causes obstacles to get in the way of receiving the feedback. So in other words, some people don't like feedback because of how the other person gives it. But It's the ability to give this feedback openly that really fosters accountability in the group. And by holding each other accountable, by giving and receiving feedback in a a healthy manner, allows teams to become, you move into this behavior, which we called in the fifth tier, called results. And for a team to really excel, all members must be willing to um, put the team's goals ahead of any individual goals. And this is how teams get results. You would expect to see from a team that is working together to produce the results, things like, you know, avoiding distractions, celebrating success. You know, these are deliberate choices made by the team. It requires discipline and persistence to uh, focus on collective results, but the payoff uh, can be big. So that's the model. Um, Again, it works because it's simple and it's sticky. After the initial assessment, you can check and measure improvements within your team six to 12 months by running a progress report. And why does it work? Well, the five behaviors model gives teams a 
common language and process to talk about issues. And it surfaces issues, it helps members to take uh, and internalize ownership for their behavior. And the five behaviors builds trust and courage on teams. So that's part two, um, driving performance through a results focused team building system. Let's look at part three, retaining talent through creating a great culture. And whether you like it or not, you have a culture in your business. The key question is, is it one you created or one you ended up with? Well, and while many people think it's just something you get or it's airy fairy or you, do, you don't pay that much attention to, culture is really a foundation or building block for your company. And if you don't create a good company culture, then nothing else will succeed. You know, all the great organizations in the world, all the great sports teams, the military, the SAS, they succeed in part because they have a fantastic culture that everyone buys into. So if you accept the premise that culture is a building block, a foundation of, of having a great company, then how do you create a great culture? And so just, let me just explain culture. Culture is the way we do things around here, and it's established by the leaders and of the business and lived by all. And that's true that you know enthusiastic and energetic employees feel better about their work and workplace, but a performance culture is not about superficial things like funky office furniture, yoga classes, and bring your dog to work days. And it's not determined by abstract feeling. Measuring workers' commitment or happiness levels, as well as catering to their wants, often fails to achieve the underlying goal of a performance culture, which is really improved business outcomes. And it requires more than completing an annual employee engagement survey and then leaving managers to get on, on their own, hoping that they'll learn something from the survey results and that will change the way they manage. And businesses improve performance when they treat employees as stakeholders of their own future and the company's future. And this means focusing on concrete performance development activities, such as clarifying work expectations, getting people what they need to do their work, providing development opportunities and promoting positive co-worker relationships. And most of us get this intellectually, and it's common sense. However, things come at us in life that get in the way of common sense, for example, revenue, shareholders, cash flow. And team and culture building is really about getting the right people doing the right things in order to accomplish a shared vision. This isn't a new idea. Jim Collins wrote about this in Good to Great, describing disciplined people and disciplined action as core components of breakthrough momentum. And mastering the Rockefeller habits, Vern Harness describes this as the right people doing the right things right. And for this reason, leadership in a growing company is about 99% alignment and 1% vision. Now, most new companies have no problem creating vision. Creating vision is what you do to attract great people, it's what you do to get them. And a lot of times it's what you do to keep them and to grow them by continually putting a big vision in front of people. It challenges them to, to reach for something beyond where they're currently at. So the vision piece is very important, but the other side of the slide is where we call what we call alignment. Alignment is just as important as vision. Without having people in alignment, you're never going to be able to do things faster, better, and cheaper. And if you don't bring your people into alignment, ensure they're accountable, you won't achieve your vision. So what we see in a lot of newer, younger, early stage businesses, a ton of vision that's being shared. But as the business travels along that path of growth and adds more people, it becomes more and more important to make sure that you've got this alignment. And the strategic planning process is all about creating that alignment and really the centerpiece of the whole thing. So here we have the one-page strategic plan template. The one-page strategic plan is the instrument that we use to get everyone on the same page, to create clarity, produce the alignment, and ultimately get the right people doing the right things right. And it's a live document that you're updating every quarter. And first you have the SWOT analysis, which stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And we also talk about emerging trends, this in section, but that often flushes out issues with the business model or, or things going on in the business. Then there's the section where you identify your business's core values. Core values are, of the, are, are the foundation of the, that accountability pyramid. Then you have your business, which uh, your purpose, which can be taken further and clearly articulated. So what it's called a, a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal, which is your vision for the business. The next series of items on the, the one-page strategic plan are the targets and the goals and the actions. And each of these has sections underneath them in the, in the plan where you fill in your, your thrust, your capabilities, your, your initiatives, and then your rocks, which your, rocks are your 90-day goals. 
and and who's accountable respectively. Next, you have KPIs. Once you figure out where you're going and how you're going to get there, you have to figure out how you're going to measure your efforts as you move in that right direction. And then you have got the brand promise and the elevator pitch. These are about thinking about what your USP is. What is it that you're doing to that gives you competitive advantage in the marketplace? What is your brand promise, your uniqueness, your elevator pitch? These are really good to identify as a team. And then lastly, you've got your annual and quarterly theme. Every company should be coming up with an annual theme that really supports the annual goals, initiatives, and rocks that the company is deriving toward the year. So that's the strategic plan. So in 2000, the average adult human had an average attention span of 12 seconds. 13 years later, once engineers had managed to put computers in our pockets, the average attention span had shrunk to measly eight seconds, only one second short of a goldfish's. And people need to hear your message seven times for for them to really hear it for the first time. Human beings have a short attention span and are a little jaded when it comes to new messages. So as a good leader, you have to remain consistent in your message. First time they hear it, they'll roll their eyes and say, oh, here we go again. Remember, you created this culture through past inconsistencies. The second time, they'll still roll their eyes a little, but by the fourth and fifth time of hearing it, they realize, okay, this is for real. By the seventh time, they'll be on board. So you have to adjust your outlook from, I've told them three times, this is so frustrating to, I've told them three times, only four more to go. So be patient and remember this is a journey. And unfortunately, most leaders are hesitant to repeat themselves. They, they walk away from a all hands meeting and think they've done a you know, a really good job of communicating by giving a speech and outlining the business strategy or priorities. And they think they've been especially thorough when they announce that they've got a, that there's a PDF copy of the slides available of the presentation. But then they seem surprised when they learn a few weeks later they, that employees aren't acting on what they were told and that most of these employees can't even repeat the business's new strategy accurately. And the problem is that leaders confuse the mere transfer of information to an audience with the audience's ability to understand internalize and embrace the message that's being communicated. The only way for people to embrace a message is to hear it over a period of time in a variety of different situations and preferably from different people. And that's why great leaders see themselves as chief reminding officers as much as anything else. The top two priorities are to set direction of the, the business and then to ensure the people are reminded of that on a regular basis. So why do many leaders fail at this? Well, Many leaders fail to realize that it's, it's that employees understand this need for repetition. They know that messaging is not so much an intellectual process, but an emotional one. Employees are not analyzing what leaders are saying based solely on whether it's intellectually compelling, but more than anything else on whether they believe the leader is serious, authentic, and committed to what they're saying. And again, that means repetition is a must. And many leaders also fail to over communicate because they get bored saying the same things over and over again. So that's understandable. Intelligent people want to be challenged, new messages and new problems to solve, and they get tired of revisiting the same topics. But that doesn't matter. The point of leadership is not to keep the leader entertained, but to mobilize people around what is most important. And when when that calls for repetition and reinforcement, which is almost always does, a good leader relishes that responsibility. And repetition is more than just a matter of communicating something again and again and again in the same way. Effective communication requires that the key messages come from different sources and through various channels using a variety of tools. So that includes electronic media from email to video conferencing to whatever technology is you know, on the market. With the most effective means of communicating a message, even in large and far-flung businesses, has nothing to do with technology and has been around since the beginning of time. And what I'm referring to is the word of mouth. And the team meeting rhythm is your organization's heartbeat. To move faster, to you need to pulse faster. And by embedding a rhythm of daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and annual meetings, these meetings bring focus and alignment, provide an opportunity to solve problems more quickly, and ultimately save time. So they also address that number one problem when people work together, communication. So let me dispel the myth that all meetings are bad, that meetings are a waste of time, that are all, there are already too many of them. To build momentum and performance and growth, you'll probably need to meet even more than you currently do. It's possible to hold extremely productive meetings that actually save time. And this is a bit more detail on um, the, the team meeting rhythm. 
Um, at the annual meeting is, again, one or two days. The annual agenda is to decide on annual goals to support the three- to five-year target. And who's attending that? Well, it's the, it's the, the management team, usually off-site. And there's the quarterly meeting. It's four to eight hours. The agenda is communicating the new quarterly actions to support the annual goals and the entire team needs. And on a monthly basis, at four hours, the agenda is to discuss the one or two strategic items impacting our actions for the quarter, and then learn and review what we've done so far in the quarter and the wider management team attends those meetings. And then on a weekly basis, it's a one or two hour meeting. And the agenda is to review the big news from the week, look at the weekly KPIs, talk about uh, who's doing what and when, and then we close close up and then attending those is usually the top management team and then lastly on a daily basis of the agenda is any breaking news kpis and you know and we're figuring out are there any bottlenecks if anyone needs help getting unstuck the entire team should be cascading huddles every day so the management team comes together for their huddle and everybody in the management team has a huddle with their direct report so all the news kpis and information from the daily huddles is is cascades through the organization in a single day. And th when this is working properly, it's amazing because a can de decision can be made by leaders on a weekly or even daily basis. And by the end of the day, the news is filtered down through the entire business, cascading through those huddles. So again, this slide is, is on the agenda scheduled for how these meetings are supposed to work. It's a standard that's been used really effective for hundreds, even thousands of fast growing companies and part of our, uh, our system. So I've talked about how strategic planning, the strategic planning process and communication through the team meeting rhythm are core of culture creation. There are three key people processes I just want to mention quickly. Leadership development, training and development is general as a key retention tool, but in particular, developing across your business, um, developing leaders across your business. And then I'll briefly touch on performance management and reward and recognition. So the research is clear. The common element across all businesses what drives a high performance environment is the environment the leader creates, not the leader themselves per se. So it's the way the leader behaves and that significantly impacts the degree of performance that is achieved. So there isn't a one size fits all leader. Leaders of high performing work groups have different skills and different competencies. What they do have in common is an intuitive sense of the environment that drives high performance. And if we look at the level of support and challenge provided by managers and break those into quadrants, we can quickly see the impact of the leader on the environment. So high levels of support, for example, the right training, the right equipment, combined with the high levels of challenge, so for example, performance development goals, behavioral feedback, creates a high performance environment. So high challenge and little support leads to a high stress environment, low support and low challenge leads to an apathetic environment, and high support and low challenge leads to high comfort environment. And we, don't know, we know that we don't grow in our comfort zones. And if you look at the spectrum of leadership styles, clearly we need a range of styles as different situations require different interventions. What's key is to understand what is your predominant style and where does it need to move to drive a high performance environment? A push directive telling people what to do offers little opportunity for learning and growth through creating a command and control environment. Whereas a pool coaching style offers much more opportunity for people in organizational learning and growth through creating a challenge and inspire environment. So you want managers and leaders across your organization who can create the right environment for people to perform. And to do that, you have to have these, develop the capabilities in them to effectively delegate, have solid performance conversations and successfully coach and provide feedback to help people develop. And then in terms of performance management, I just want to cheer the 20-60-20 rule here as a useful guide for you. So high performers are the driving force of your organization. They are the distinct group of employees that are fully that fully engage in their work and seek out information necessary to do their jobs. To keep them motivated and challenged, it's in your best interest to find out their goals and aspirations and have a, a clear, what, clear development path for them. And then you've got to struggle for the soul of the middle 60%. Middle level performers bring depth and stability to the company, slowly but surely improve organizational performance, they are the backbone of your business. So you have to implement learning resources, recognition schemes, and mentoring po programs to boost engagement and performance. And then you've got to begin to eliminate the bottom 20%, the lowest performers. They will actually impede progress towards accomplishing the, the, the work group or the business's goals and will negatively affect others. And just to be clear, your top performers are not necessarily the people at the top of your business. You'll have a need top performers across your business. And if you're, and if, you're thinking, well, we're a small business, we're just 10 people. Well, two 
Oh, two of what of that 10 are your top performers and two are your bottom performers. And then finally, reward and recognition. This is the most important hygiene factor, especially when it comes, there's not a lot of money about. You want to go crazy on recognition, especially with no money. Things like CEO, handwritten thank you cards have an amazing impact on individuals. Recognition award schemes, for example, with vouchers as an award for individual or team performance or above the call of duty awards, they have an amazing impact and reinforce both results and behaviours. Giving them permission to have fun. Of course, there's things like the pizza lunch from time to time, but encouraging people to do things like charity fundraising events and even consider, for example, a charity match scheme. A company would match charity donations raised up to £150. You can set the figure any amount according to your budget. So that's part three, um, talent, uh, retaining talent through creating a great culture. I'm going to wrap up there. And if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them. Um, you're probably in one of three places. Maybe you're at the end of this and you say, hey, I'm good. I got this. That's a lot. I've got a couple of tips. That's the case. Awesome. I'm happy, very happy for you. In fact, really impressed with your success. Two, if you, you might be in a place where I'm pretty good with this, but I have a question or two. And if that's the case for you, then feel free to go to www.timeofshane.com. Happy to answer. No obligation. Happy to talk to you for 15 minutes and have a chat about or answer the question or how to do this or how to do that. And third, you... Uh, might be in a place where you're thinking, well, you know what, I need some help with this. And because I'm struggling or with this or some other areas of my business, and in fact, you again, go to www.timemachine.com and book a call. Let's have a quick chat about what you're experiencing in the business. If we feel like a fit, uh, we'll go ahead and book a longer 90-minute discovery call. And if at the end of that, it feels like we're a fit, we'll talk about how we might work together. So when people think about business coaching, they're often thinking about business growth, the systems, tools, and strategies around business. But business coaching is also about personal growth and coaching, and that's usually around leadership, communication, and delegation. And then finally, the other part of coaching is holding you accountable for the stuff you say you're going to do. And when you bring all that together, and that, that all comes together into getting the results you want. And when people start working with me, it's because they want their businesses to be coached. But what we learn over time as we work together, it's really the person that needs to be coached. A lot of business owners think about personal coaching as like, oh, we're going to be sitting around burning insects or that kind of stuff. But that's not, not at all. So there you go. Uh, let's look at uh, taking any questions there might be.